Welcome to Let the Quran Speak. I'm Aisha, your host. As I reflect on the World Day of International Justice this month, I can't help but think of all the injustices going on right here at home, starting with the indigenous community, for example. I believe, as I have been taught, that Islam is a religion of justice. If we all take this to be true, then what are the Islamic teachings around justice that should guide our behaviors and our actions as communities and as individuals? Let's try to tackle this complex issue with Dr. Shabir Ali. Welcome to the show, Dr. Shabir. Pleasure to be on. So we're talking about Islam uh, and justice today. So um, a very simple question. Does Islam advocate or call for justice? Absolutely. In, in fact, uh, all of Sharia, could, uh, the Islamic law, could be narrowed down into a simple word. Um, justice, uh, that, that's the goal of uh, all of Islamic law. And so let's, let's break it down a bit and let's start. Are there verses in the Quran that specifically speak to the importance of justice? Yes, uh, there are several verses. Um, uh, for example, in Surah 5, the, the eighth uh, verse, it says, Ya yuwaladina amanu kunu qawamina lillahi shuhada bil qist. O you who believe, uh, be steadfast uh, for God, uh, standing up for justice. Uh, of being witnesses mm -hmm. uh, for justice. Um, uh, do not let the hatred of other people cause you to swerve from justice. Yeah, dilu. Now, now this is a direct command. Be just. Mm -hmm. That is uh, closer to piety. And how did the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, sort of act on these principles or act on these guidelines that are in the Quran? Well, uh, first of all, in, during his uh, time of the prophetic call in, in the early phase when he was in, in uh, Mecca and he and his uh, companions were being persecuted, his family and so on were being persecuted by those who did not want the message of Islam to flourish, uh, he still called for justice, justice and fairness for all, justice for the orphans, for the widows, uh, for those who are downtrodden in society. Uh, when he migrated and set up a polity in uh, Medina, where he spent the last uh, years of his life, uh, there he established a society that was um, uh, governed by justice. Uh, there was fairness for all, uh, even non-Muslims who lived in the area um, at, at a time when people did not give rights to minorities uh, were given their rights. Uh, he, he drew up the constitution of Medina, which guaranteed uh, the rights of minorities living in the area, uh, Jews in particular, to some of the high offices of, of the Muslims. Um, uh, within that Muslim polity. So uh, the, the justice is to be extended in, in the Islamic system to all aspects around us, to, to the environment, uh, to the animals, uh, to the extent that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, cautioned people against uh, piling up two, uh, he loads that are too heavy uh, on animals, heavier than the animals are, are, are normally able to carry. And are there, so, um, you know, learning from the Quran now, the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, are there um, ways that uh, for, Muslim, for the Muslim community, are there guidelines in terms of when and how you're speaking out for justice, or is it sort of like a blanket, you know, you take it as you go along kind of thing? Well, uh, we, we are enjoined both in the Quran and uh, in uh, statements attributed to our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, to stand up for justice. And uh, there, there is a hadith that says, uh, whoever um, sees a, a, a disagreeable thing should change it. Um, and if he's able, then he changes it by, you know, his own hand. And if he cannot, then uh, he um, speaks out against it. Uh, so speaking out against injustice, this is uh, one of the hallmarks of, of the prophets, uh, the prophets of the Hebrew Bible, Jesus uh, on whom be peace of the New Testament, and our prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in, in the Quran. And um, it is noted uh, in a saying attributed to our prophet, peace be upon him, that uh, a, the, a, the, the statement of truth uh, in the face of a tyrant uh, is the greatest level of struggle in the mm -hmm. way of God. So just, um, you know, talking on this point about speaking out, uh, you know, there are a lot of injustices going on right now in the world. And um, what we've started to see is that, you know, there are some, um, some scholars choose to use, uh, or imams rather, use, choose to use their, um, you know, their minbar or give, use their platforms uh, where they can speak to actually speak out against injustices. But there are some who, um, 
who say, no, we're not going to speak about anything political because they, they want to remove the politics out of the congregation. So when we say that, okay, it's important to speak out, but then you have, uh, you know, this other approach that some people are taking within the community, how do you sort of reconcile or make sense of that? Mm -hmm. So some things in Islam are very clear, like this is what you do, and you do this at a particular time. So we pray five times per day, for example, and the prayer times are fairly well defined. We fast th uh, 29 or 30 days of Ramadan, depending on how the moon becomes visible and so on. Um, so the, uh, these are well defined and there's no mm -hmm. ifs, ands and buts about them, you just do them. Uh, but there, there are some things that require some judgment as to how and when to apply them. So there's the general principle of speaking out against injustice, but then how and why do you, do you apply this? So, okay, there's a principle of speaking the truth always, right? But if you take it in an, in an absolute sense, then, then you might find uh, situations in which you can't really apply that. Uh, for example, an Imam al-Ghazal Rahimullah, may God have mercy on him, one of our pious and ancient scholars, um, it said that uh, you know you, you see a person running through the hall, uh, going through the, the coming in one way, running through the other exit, and then uh, uh, another person coming through, sword in hand, uh, uh, with the obvious intention of finding and killing this person mm -hmm. who is escaping his sword. So it, it becomes incumbent upon you to misdirect this uh, swordsman. Uh, to save the life of that person who has just fled. Uh, so this misdirection uh, is, is, you know, goes against the absolutist uh, statement that we must speak the truth uh, at all times. Mm -hmm. So here is the statement, uh, speak the truth in the face uh, of the tyrant. Uh, but, but now that requires some judgment. Like let's say you go confront a tyrant uh, about his tyranny. Uh, maybe you might enrage him and then he goes out and kills a lot more people than he has done before just because you've enraged him mm -hmm. by your act of speaking the truth. So now you, you, you have to ask yourself, do I speak in this circumstance? What do I say? How to say it? Uh, are there some intermediary means? Can I convince him by some other uh, method? Uh, is this a situation in which we ought to be patient for a while and, and let uh, things bad as they are pass because they will pass and, and we expect that something better will come in the future? So a lot of judgment calls. Of course, we're not God and we cannot uh, know uh, everything, uh, but we do the best we can in certain circumstances to see how best to approach uh, the situation to bring about uh, the best possible results. So thinking about it, so those are obviously good examples and completely mm -hmm. agree with them. But what about in situations where, for example, we're living in Canada, you know, we do know that there are injustices, for example, happening against the Rohingya Muslims, for example. Is it incumbent on um, imams who, who have a platform or scholars who have a platform to, to raise awareness about those issues within their congregation? And is the response that I'm not going to talk about this because I don't want to make things political, is that Okay. Yeah, the idea of not making things political, this is, um, it seems foreign to Islamic thinking because mm -hmm. uh, uh, we don't have a compartmentalized uh, religion which says that, you know, we're only dealing with spirituality and what happens in the world is, is not our concern. Of course, what happens in the world is our concern. And where we have the freedom to speak, it becomes incumbent upon us to, to speak. Uh, it is mentioned in the hadith that God will ask people on the day of judgment, such and such a thing was happening and you saw that. Well, why didn't you say something? And somebody will say, you know, but, uh, you know, I feared the people. And God will say, well, you had more uh, reason to fear me. Uh, so, um, w indeed, there are situations in which people might be excused for their fear of tyranny and oppression. Um, you can imagine a, a situation where a scholar in some other part of the world speaks against the government and the next thing you know he disappears mm -hmm. and his family suffers from his uh, absence. Um, or, or, you know, may, maybe worse than this happens than just his uh, mere, that's bad enough, his disappearance, but worse than that could happen. Uh, but in, in places like Canada, uh, where, you know, basically the, the idea of freedom of expression is championed, uh, Muslim scholars do have the obligation to speak the truth, to speak it clearly, and to speak truth to power. Um, and, and we don't have an excuse. We can't mm -hmm. say, okay, we feared. What did you fear? And uh, of course, people can invent all kinds of fears. You know, I, I feared uh, that we wouldn't get the next donation, or I feared that, uh, you know, my citizenship might uh, be revoked or I fear, you know, people can have different levels of fear and how people respond to these uh, different levels, uh, this is between them and God. But uh, I would encourage uh, Muslim scholars 
uh, to uh, bring to, uh, to the awareness of their congregations and uh, to the world at large. Have your speeches and khutbas, your sermons uh, taped and, and have these on YouTube and for the world to see. And, and speak against the injustices against the Rohingya people, injustices against the Palestinian people. Mm -hmm. Most uh, recently uh, with uh, some 59 persons being killed in, in one day. Um, uh, with the Prime Minister of Canada calling for an independent investigation uh, into the shooting of uh, a, a, an Ontario doctor who was... Uh, Tara, Dr. Tara Klobani. Yes, yeah. who was obviously there for, to assist uh, mm -hmm. the, the wounded. Um, so the, uh, we need to speak against uh, injustices, and if we do not, then uh, uh, I believe that God will hold us accountable. How do you, you raised a very interesting point about, you know, when so scholars in some, some parts of the world are speaking out, they sort of disappear. Um, and we're seeing this happen. So how do you sort of begin to address that issue or tackle it? Well, th those of us who ha do have the freedom to speak should speak against this very injustice of um, um, muzzling the, the voices of, of Muslim scholarship, uh, especially in, in, the, in the Muslim world. And um, at, at the same time, I want to bring to, to light another a aspect of this. While I've spoken about uh, the need for Muslim scholars to uh, voice uh, opinions um, uh, regarding the mm -hmm. uh, injustices in the world, uh, some scholars are not uh, obviously trained to, to speak at this level and mm -hmm. to engage with the public. Some scholars do have a, a, a very basic sort of... Um, um, madrasa training, mm -hmm. uh, Islamic uh, traditional type of schooling uh, that allows them to function within the Muslim prayer space. They know how to perform the prayers according to traditional uh, Islamic rules. Uh, they can guide people uh, um, you know, regarding some traditional uh, aspects of Islamic teaching. But if, if they're put in the public sphere, um, some of these uh, persons may actually become an embarrassment to the community just because they don't understand the language, the ethos, the, the modus operandi of, of so how So it's about getting proper media, media training and public speaking training before you sort of go out and sort of take this on. Yes, so I think the, it's a wise move from the uh, part of uh, some scholars who have had that basic training, uh, who, who lack the kind of media savviness, uh, to say, okay, we're just going to deal with things internally and we're just going to speak about uh, the traditional Islamic types of uh, uh, learning. We're going to describe the prayer and, and the fasting and we're going to describe even mundane things and, and in fact they restrict themselves to those things uh, because they do well in those spheres and, and they recognize their limitations. If that is the case, yeah, l let, let's all recognize our limitations and, and do what we're capable of doing. Uh, but uh, let's also enhance our abilities so that we can actually function in the modern world. This is not like functioning in the modern world if you have your prayer space uh, isolated as a cocoon from mm -hmm. the uh, things that are happening around us uh, so that our sermons and the mosques cannot be dated. Uh, things could be happening all around us and the, and the sermon in the mosque is, is the same sermon that has been delivered like 300 years ago mm -hmm. that you had in a book and you just came and read it out or you didn't read it out uh, but you came and delivered the same ideas um, or you, you didn't find it in the book but basically you're delivering the same ideas that would have been spoken about in the same way that it was spoken about some 300 years ago. No, the situation has changed and you need to show how the Islamic teachings apply uh, to the policies of the um, uh, United States government, uh, the policies of the Israeli government, policies of the Saudi crown prince. Uh, you, you need to talk about what's happening on the ground here and now to show that Islam is actually relevant to our present situation. And that's it's not something that is only theoretical and backward and, and out of place from our modern society. I think a very informative and important discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Shreer. You're welcome. Hey YouTube, we hope you benefited from this video. If you liked it, or if you didn't, let us know in the comments below. And if you're interested in learning more, check out some of our other videos. And don't forget to subscribe so you can get new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday.